Okay, so we had this result, which was a funny average along orbits of e to the i k dot x minus i omega t. And this was in pursuit, you remember, of finite Larmor radius or finite gyro radius effects. And that allows us then to calculate the average, average over gyro phase angle, of minus infinity up to zero, uh, dt double prime as phi tilde of t double prime. And, uh, well, okay, using this, you can see that, that all I'm, well, if I integrate dt double prime and the, the phi tilde, I guess I'll, I'll do it out a little bit here. So I'll have i uh, phi tilde of x and t, and then the sum n equals minus infinity to infinity, jn squared of k perp v perp over omega c. And now all I really have to integrate this time history integral over is this last exponential factor, and that just gives me uh, e to the i n omega c plus k parallel v parallel minus omega times t double prime, all divided by i uh, n omega c plus k parallel v parallel minus omega, all evaluated from t double prime equals minus infinity up to zero. Now there's a factor of i that goes out, and it turns out that the only the lower limit, oh, I'm sorry, only the upper limit, at the upper limit, the e to the i t double prime, you know, just goes to one, so it's one over this singular denominator. What about the other one at minus infinity? Well, remember that we defined when we did um, initial value problems that the imaginary omega part of omega had to be greater than sigma in order for the initial definition to be valid. And if we use that, it turns out that, that all of this contribution at the lower limit becomes zero. So the net result of that um, is that all this just becomes uh, phi tilde of x and t times the sum n equals minus infinity to infinity jn squared of k perp v perp over omega c, all divided by n omega c plus k parallel v parallel minus omega. And if you now go back and stick this into what we had, uh, you can show that our then our average distribution function f of x, v, and t, averaged over gyro phase, is just minus uh, q phi tilde over t <coughs> times the Maxwellian. And then there's 1 plus and then sum uh, n equals minus infinity to infinity uh, omega jn squared k perp v perp over omega c divided by n omega c uh, plus k parallel v parallel minus omega. And again, what do these two terms mean? Well, the one is the adiabatic part, and this whole second term is the non-adiabatic part. It's the non-adiabatic response of the plasma exhibiting cyclotron harmonics, the strength of which is governed by how big the perpendicular gyro radius is compared to the perpendicular wavelength. And there's a sort of omega out in front. So if we take omega to zero, we'll more or less get zero. OK, now this is the perturbed distribution function. How do I get? a dispersion relation. Well, we're dealing with electrostatics, so as usual, all we need is the perturbed charge density, hence the perturbed densities of electrons and ions. And so far, I haven't told you whether I'm dealing with electrons or ions, so kinetically, we've been dealing with both. 
So what I need to do is take that perturbed distribution function and convert it into a perturbed density. So uh, let's call it the perturbed density. So what that would be is that n tilde would be the integral over all velocity space of the f tilde. But the integral over all velocity space, we found it convenient to deal in cylindrical velocity space. So this becomes the integral from 0 to 2 pi of um, d theta, the integral from 0 to infinity, v perp dv perp, and the integral from 0 to infinity, I'm sorry, minus infinity to infinity, dv parallel of f tilde. But we used up, so to speak, the d theta, so we'll put in 2 pi over 2 pi, and then we can write this as just 2 pi integral from 0 to infinity, v perp dv perp minus infinity to infinity, dv parallel, and then the average of f tilde over theta. Okay, so all I have to do is I take this perturbed, dense, perturbed distribution function and I perform this integral. Now, if you do that, the first thing you notice is that if I just integrate the Maxwellian and the 1, I'm just going to get density back. So that part will be okay. <coughs> How am I going to take care of the integration over these other things? Well, again, you have to use a few identities. It turns out that the integral from 0 to infinity of 2x dx e to the minus x squared jn squared of some variable, which I'll call s, x, is equal to e to the minus s squared over 2 times i sub n of s squared over 2. But we often define something called b, which is equal to s squared over 2, which is k perp squared v perp squared over 2 omega c squared. I'm sorry, that should be k perp v thermal squared. And this would then be k perp squared rho squared over rho thermal squared over 2, or k perp squared temperature over mass times cyclotron frequency squared. Anyway, all of that, um, well, and, and I should have said that S is equal to V perp over V thermal. It's kind of funny notation, V perp over V thermal. So using that, you can do the perpendicular integrations because there's no, in that singular denominator, the only place you get into perpendiculars is here, and the Maxwellian has an e to the minus mv perp squared. So that's where the e to the minus x squared comes from. And the jn squared gives you, you know, this jn squared. But I still have the parallel integration to do. What kind of an integration is that? Well, this is an integral dv parallel of e to the minus v parallel squared divided by v parallel minus a bunch of stuff. So that's our plasma dispersion function, which we had before, it turns out. That's what our plasma dispersion function was. So when you finish all of this, what you end up with is n tilde of x and t. I'll just write it out now a little bit more. Is minus q uh, n naught over t phi tilde uh, well, of x and t. And then, of course, we'll get our adiabatic response as usual. And then we'll have the sum n equals minus infinity to infinity. And then you have these Bessel functions, i sub n of b, e to the minus b. So this was the jn squareds that got integrated over a whole Maxwellian distribution. Then it turns out you end up with an omega over k parallel v thermal. Uh, and then we have a, I need a little more space here, I see, a z function with omega minus n omega c divided by um, k 
K parallel V thermal. So that's our perturbed density response. And again, the first term is the adiabatic, the second term is the non-adiabatic. If we have this perturbed density response, how do we get a dispersion relation? Well, we start out with Gauss's law, perturbed, del dot E is equal to rho tilde over epsilon naught, and E tilde is minus grad phi, and this becomes then plus K squared phi tilde is equal to 1 over epsilon naught, summation over species, uh, NJ tilde QJ. And if you put in the density, perturbed density response, which we just obtained, um, then you can show, and remember I can make this into a dielectric constant by, it could be, it could have been del dot D for the displacement vector equals zero. And so we work through that. You find that you have epsilon hat of K and omega divided by epsilon naught, the dielectric constant relative to the dielectric of free space is 1, which is just the vacuum. And, and I'm sorry, uh, well, yeah, is, is the vacuum. And then we get the sum over species of 1 over k squared lambda to by j squared. And then we have 1 plus, and then the sum over all the cyclotron harmonics, n equals minus infinity, infinity, i sub n of bj, e to the minus bj, and then an additional factor, omega over k parallel v thermal times z of omega minus n omega cj k parallel v thermal j. It's supposed to be a K parallel, kind of hard to see. And I better close parentheses. So this is our electrostatic perturbed dielectric constant. And with constant magnetic field. Now, oops, sorry. <laughs> didn't, didn't down at the bottom here. Yeah. So this is our perturbed uh, electrostatic dielectric constant. Now, is that what I expected? Well, again, anytime you get some supposedly more complicated thing, always try to take back a few things like, you know, hey, what if I go back to an unmagnetized plasma? So let's look at an unmagnetized plasma. What was the dielectric constant there? Well, it turns out we had an epsilon hat over epsilon naught was 1 minus the sum over j, a 1 over 2 k squared lambda to by j squared of z prime of omega over k uh, v thermal j. Now, uh, again, I'm too far off the bottom. Sorry here. Bloop. Yeah. Okay. Now, it turns out that this z has a certain property that this is minus 2 times 1 plus its argument z, z of z. Um, and it turns out we have written it in the equivalent form. So I'll write this out as 1 and minus 2, and the 2's take care of it. And so it becomes 1 plus summation over j of 1 over uh, k squared lambda to by j squared, and then 1 plus omega over k v thermal j, z of omega over k v thermal j. 
Okay, so this is now at least sort of in the same form, okay, as the one we just got. But what are the sort of differences between the one with the magnetic field and the one without the magnetic field? So this is B naught goes to zero. Um, this is epsilon hat or epsilon naught. So let me just, well, write them then. So let's call this differences. The first difference is that the um, 1 over kvz minus omega, which we had without the magnetic field, went to 1 over, well, it went actually to jn squared of k perp v perp over omega c divided by n omega c plus k parallel v parallel minus omega. So what that said is we introduced cyclotron harmonics. And that's because perpendicular to the magnetic field, particles are just gyrating. And I guess maybe I'll leave the sum in there as well. The fact and fact thing is that we have a weighting factor of Jn squared of k perp v perp over omega c. And if you just imagine some wave is coming along, the distance, the perpendicular wavelength, okay, would be, this would be lambda perp, which would be 2 pi over k perp, would be that distance. And then, you know, I might have a gyro radius about this big. So that's a, a gyro radius, which is equal to v perp over omega c. So all this factor says is have a weighting factor that takes account of are the gyro radii small compared to the perpendicular wavelength, which would be a small argument limit, versus are they large, in which case you'd take the large argument limit of the Bessel functions, and then you'd have to average them. Finally, the difference, well, a difference, uh, if you take B naught goes to zero, um, we get the usual result. Uh, because the limit as b goes to zero uh, of i sub n of b e to the minus b is just equal to a Kronecker delta n naught. You only get the zeroth order one. Okay, now this is a very complicated dispersion relation. Uh, and this is only the electrostatic one. It gets much more complicated if you deal with electromagnetics, which Chen gives you the whole thing, or shows you what that looks like. But I wanted to a kind of special case, which uh, is, is sort of important. And that special case uh, is the case k parallel equals zero. What that means is, then my waves are not propagating along the field line at all. They're propagating totally perpendicular to the magnetic field. And so k has become k perp then. Now, to work out that case, we need to take the limit as k parallel goes to zero of z of omega minus n omega cj divided by k parallel v thermal j. And it turns out, if you look at our limits before, this just becomes minus k parallel v thermal j divided by omega minus n omega cj. So that allows us to simplify our dispersion relation quite a lot, namely epsilon hat over epsilon naught just becomes 1 plus sum over j, 1 over k squared lambda divided by j squared. 
and then 1 plus the sum n equals minus infinity to infinity. And now that k parallel factor is going to cancel out. So all you get is omega i sub n of b, e to the minus b, divided by, uh, oh, and I didn't take the minus sign, so I'll have to make it n omega cj minus omega. And those are bj's. So now I don't even have in any imaginary part at all. I just got rid of the entire imaginary part. Um, so this is a little strange, perhaps. A second thing is, so, but I still got all these cyclotron resonances. Okay, I've got the first cyclotron resonance, the second cyclotron resonance, and so forth, modulated in their amplitude by this, you know, Bessel function up here. I sub n e to the minus n, e to the minus b. Now, what we found, how did we, oh, by the way, how, uh, suppose I multiply this all out and get myself a polynomial expansion for w, or omega. I want to set the dielectric constant equal to zero to get myself a, uh, a dispersion relation for the waves, okay? So epsilon hat over epsilon naught goes to equal zero for a dispersion relation. Suppose I do that. Uh, how high order a polynomial is do I get in omega? How about a denumerable infinity of omega? You know, I've got omega to the infinity, right? And so I say, well, I'll only worry about 100 harmonics. Well, 100 means a 100 order polynomial. So how did we find that it was good to try to analyze these sorts of things? Well. What we found was it was convenient to rewrite this as a density functional is equal to, because we can bring out a density here, is equal to a frequency functional. And so you can actually define some reference cyclotron frequency divided by some reference plasma frequency, sum over species omega squared. And I'll just write out how it looks and then sketch a couple things here. Omega pj squared over omega p squared. Um, and then this is the sum n equals minus infinity to infinity n omega cj divided by n omega cj minus omega and then i sub n of bj e to the minus bj all divided by bj. And the point is that this whole thing is some function of omega and this whole thing is some function of 1 over the equilibrium density. So with that in mind, I make a plot. Uh, and I'll just briefly sketch what that looks like. Oh, yeah, that one. Yeah, sorry. OK, so what I'm going to plot is basically h of omega versus omega. And I'm going to have a whole bunch of these cyclotron harmonics. Um, right now to do my axes a little clearer. And I'll just uh, plot what it usually turns out to be for B of order 1. Namely, um, put all this together and uh, as I go further and further out the harmonic strengths become smaller and smaller yeah. and if I then put on here this particular position, which is omega squared over omega p squared, so it's some particular plasma density. Basically, what you do is you have a bunch of modes just above the cyclotron harmonics, and so this gives you omega greater than or equal to n omega c, and these are called so called Bernstein modes after Ira Bernstein, who first 
did the theory of them. And they're resonances, but there's no cyclotron damping of them. And you can convert this into an omega over K diagram as well uh, with all these finite Larmor radius effects. The fundamental point is that with these finite gyro radius effects, B of order 1, you can then have harmonics at all of the cyclotron frequencies, not just the uh, first one. So this is omega C, 2 omega C, and so forth, minus omega C. So, um, there's many other subjects that you get into. You can have, uh, if you have a finite K parallel, all that does is create a little imaginary part around the, each of the resonances because you can have a K parallel V thermal spread effect. Um, and Chen gives a lot more of the complete dielectric, uh, dielectric constant business. Anyway, you can also, out of this general dispersion relation, get cyclotron waves, upper hybrid waves, lower hybrid waves, all the sorts of things we talked about in waves. So we'll quit here and just say that magnetic fields can introduce a lot of interesting complications, particularly cyclotron resonances, Bernstein, Bernstein waves, and so forth. Next time, we'll go into the nonlinear theory, uh, Chapter 7.